All right, so as we head into every new month, I'm going to be preaching a sermon that is going to explain the new challenge, the new challenge ahead of us. So we're finishing up our soul winning challenge in the month of February. Wednesday is the last day of February, so we only got a few days left to be just making sure you're preaching the gospel to at least one person every single day. Try to give the gospel. And we're following up this challenge with the baptism challenge. Now, I think that this is probably even harder than the soul winning challenge. Making sure you get out every single day and try to preach the gospel to at least one person, that's, that's somewhat of a difficult challenge. It's not that easy to do. Sometimes you forget you have a lot of stuff going on and it's not always at the forefront of your mind. You need to make sure you make it a point to get out there and do that. Now, the baptism challenge is, um, in a sense, it's easier. You don't have to be going out every single day. But here's why it's difficult is that, you know, if you've noticed and if you've been coming here for any length of time, it's, 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 we don't have a high number of baptisms. And getting people baptized sometimes can be very difficult. Getting somebody saved is much easier because... Receiving the free gift of salvation is very easy. It's not a hard thing to do. All a person has to do is understand the gospel and receive it. They need to call on the name of the Lord. As the Bible says here in Acts 2, uh, 21, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's it. It's that simple. We do the work. We put forth the effort. We go out. We have our Bible in hand. We preach the word of God. All they have to do is stand there Listen and receive it. And if they receive it, praise God, they're saved. But it's, it, it takes more effort. It takes more work for a person to then decide, after they get saved, to do what's right. To make the right choices. To say, now I'm going to you know, show my gratitude to Christ and I'm going to come to church and I'm going to you know, get baptized, and I'm going to do more for him. That requires more work. And just as it required work for us to go out and preach the gospel to people and to, and to lead them to Christ, it's also going to require some work on our part to try to follow up with some people and encourage them and to just maybe help them along. So, what we're going to need to do is just stay, stay focused on this. And uh, I'm going to get into a little bit more of the reasons why some people, I think, don't get baptized today. And, and um, to help you to, to maybe um, consider those reasons when you're talking to someone and to try to encourage them to get baptized. Because baptism is important. Now, we know, and I'm going to go through... A little bit of the history here. So keep your place in Acts 2. Turn back to John chapter 1. I'm going to discuss for the first half of this sermon just a little bit about baptism, a little bit about what it means, and um, definitely going to spend a little bit of time proving to you that it is not a requirement for salvation. It is not a part, any step that we need to take in order to be saved. Because we know salvation is just by grace through faith. But, um, but it is an important uh, aspect of our Christian life. It is something that everybody ought to do. So keep your place in Acts 2. Put a bookmarker there because we're coming back to Acts 2. But in John chapter 1, we're going to see when baptisms first started. Because they, they weren't doing baptisms in the Old Testament. When they were sacrificing the animals and doing all this other stuff. All the way up until the point, until John the Baptist came on the scene with his ministry, he was the first one to really start baptizing people, at least within the Christianity religion, at least within the religion of, of the Lord. Now, we have references to baptism, like the, the people of Israel, the children of Israel were baptized in the cloud when Moses led them through the Red Sea. Like, we, we, have, we have symbolism and pictures of baptism, but not actual just like we do today. Hey, someone gets saved. We're going to take them. We're going to dunk them underwater. They're going to come back up, and they're baptized in the name of the Lord. So that wasn't happening until John the Baptist came, and that's why he has the name John the Baptist, because he was the first one. He came on the scene and started baptizing people and made a difference. So we're going to see a little bit of that story here in John chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse number 25. The Bible says, And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, 
nor Elias, nor that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptized. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After he cometh, after me, excuse me, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So one of the reasons why John started baptizing is, is for the coming of Jesus Christ. He says, you know, I baptize with water. I'm doing this with water. And now that word baptize, before I go any further, the word baptize or baptism, it's what's known as a transliteration from the Greek into English. And, and all that means is that the word baptism didn't really exist on its own in the English language. It was taken from the Greek and not really translated. It, it, it's, it's more of like a, like a Greek word because what, it, what ultimately what it really means is like immersion, but uh, the, this act of baptizing people was something that, um, that it's, it's, it's its own thing, right? It, it means immersion, which is one of the reasons why we do um, you know, the, the baptism of someone going all the way underwater. We fill up a tub, a baptismal tub, and, and a person, when they get baptized, goes completely under the water and comes back up because the word literally means to be immersed. You're completely surrounded by the water. So when John was baptizing people in water, he was completely immersing them in the water, and then they would come up. You have religions today that do baptisms by maybe taking a little bit of water, like I have here, and just you know, sprinkling it, and they call that a baptism. That's common in the Catholic Church. Or they'll, they'll take some water in a cup or a pitcher, and they'll just kind of pour it over someone's head, and they'll call that a baptism. And those are not scriptural baptisms. That's not what the Bible describes. We see over and over again, and I'm not going to go through this. I've done this in other sermons on baptism in the past, where it shows, you know, John was, was baptizing near Enon because there was much water there. Why would you need much water if all you need to do is sprinkle a few drops or pour over someone's head? We see Jesus and John both going down into the water. You know, they're going all the way down in the water and then they come back up out of the water. It, it, it's, it's so clear and evident. And even again, just from the word baptize alone, when you understand what that word means, it means to be immersed. It means the immersion. So John says here, he says, hey, I'm baptizing with water, but there's going to be somebody coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And we're going to get into the baptism of the Holy Ghost in just a minute, because if you realize that baptism and the baptism of water is being immersed by water, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is being immersed with the Holy Ghost, of just being just completely, you know, flooded with the Holy Ghost, just upon you, God's Spirit just poured out upon somebody. And that's why we're going to see, well, we'll get there in just a minute because I want to finish up here with John chapter one. So he says, I baptize with water. There's someone else coming because John was, was preparing the way for the Lord. He was making the path straight. He was getting everything ready for Jesus Christ basically to be announced. Hey, here's the lamb of God. Now follow him. John did all this work and preaching and baptizing and, and, and leading people ultimately to just say, here is the Christ, and to do the presentation of Jesus Christ, which is what he did. So he says, um, verse 31, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. So he stirs things up, and he's saying, hey, I need to make the Lord known. I need to make the Christ known unto Israel. That's why I'm baptizing. That's why I'm doing all this so that I can show the coming of the Lord here. Verse 32, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me. So John received instruction from an angel, from God, in order to go out and baptize. He didn't just come up with this on his own, saying, hey, I'm just going to start baptizing people. He was instructed to start baptizing people and the same messenger, the same angel that told him <coughs> that, hey, I want you to baptize with water. He says, the same said unto me, 
upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So, John is given information on how he is to know who is Christ. Because he's going out and he's looking for him. He doesn't know that Jesus is Christ until he baptizes him and he sees the Holy Ghost from heaven. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the Spirit descending from heaven. And it says the Spirit descended in a bodily form. So it's like the, the Spirit descends. It's like a man but it descends like a dove, so kind of like floating down or flying down, as you would imagine a dove coming down from heaven. And that, that bodily form of the Spirit came and rested on Jesus and remained on him. And that, that bodily form, I mean, if you think about, think about just, try to imagine seeing like a spirit, an apparition, right? A ghost that has the form of a man and then come and just kind of superimpose itself right over another body. That's what happened with Jesus. So like you've got the spirit, and I kind of think of it just kind of like glowing, you know, like all over, all around him because he's completely immersed with the spirit. And then he goes out and has, of course, this power of the Holy Ghost to go out and baptize other people with the Holy Ghost. So, um, and he says in verse 34, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. He's saying like, this is what I saw, this is how I know, this is what I was told, and there's the man right there. Behold the Lamb of God. He would point people to follow Jesus Christ. So this is the beginning. Now turn back, if you would, the book of Acts. We're going to go to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to see more about the baptism of the Holy Ghost that he talked about, that he preached about, that he says, hey, you know, I'm just here baptizing with water, but I'm not the one that you need to be worried about or focused on. You need to be focused on the one that's coming after me. He says, you know, the, the latch of sho whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. The Christ is coming, and all I'm here to do is to point you to him. <coughs> My baptism is just with water, but he has a baptism of the Holy Ghost much more powerful, much more meaningful than my baptism of water. Everything that John was preaching and teaching and saying was saying it's not about me, it's about him. Worry about Jesus. Follow Jesus. And this prophecy and the, you know, what, he's, what he's talking about here with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, people get real confused about this, but it's not confusing at all if we just go to Scripture look for what the answer is. Because the Pentecostals want to, want to take this and use it and turn it into something it's not. But I'm not going to get too far off into that. Look at Acts chapter 1. We're going to see the fulfillment, basically, of the baptism of the Holy Ghost that came upon the disciples. Acts chapter 1, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. So he's telling them not to leave Jerusalem. This is at, you know, Acts chapter 1. This is right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, in the book of John. They're, now they're all gathered together. And they're instructed. You say, wait. Wait for the promise. Wait for that promise that you received of the Father, that you've heard of me. This is Jesus Christ speaking to him. <coughs> for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So there's no doubt about what he's talking about here. It's the same thing that John was, was preaching, saying, I baptize with water, but there's one coming that, that's mightier than I, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And now he's saying, look, that hasn't happened yet. Wait for the promise. The promise is that Jesus Christ is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. He hadn't really done that while he was on this earth. It wasn't until after his resurrection, here in the book of Acts, we're going to see now the fulfillment of that prophecy that John the Baptist was making when he was preaching in the wilderness. Verse number six, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the time, the times of the seasons which the father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria 
and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So this is chapter 1. And this is the instruction that they're receiving, saying just wait at Jerusalem, wait here, you're going to receive the promise, it's going to happen soon, and just hang out here. And then we see in chapter 2 is the fulfillment of this. At chapter 2 is where we actually see the baptism of the Holy Ghost that comes upon them. And notice what comes with the Holy Ghost is the boldness and the power to go out and witness and to witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the world because the Holy Ghost comes upon them to give them the boldness to go out and preach and do the work of God. Acts chapter 2, let's look back here where we started reading this morning in verse number 1, keeping in mind that a baptism is a full immersion. And we're going to see this explicitly uh, given an account of in Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 1, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So all the disciples are together, they're meeting together, they're having church service, everyone's meeting together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled, there's your emergency, it filled all the house where they were sitting. So they hear this sound, it's like this wind and it just fills the whole room where they're gathered together, the place where they're sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Cloven means it's parted. So if you think of like a snake tongue, right? It's got split down the middle. They have these tongues that are just kind of resting on them. And it's like this fiery looking tongue. Kind of, a, I, I can only imagine what it looked like, but it sounds pretty cool. And they were all filled. There's that word again, being filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So these men, they, this, is, this is the baptism. There's this rushing wind sound. They're in a place. They're all filled. The room's filled with it and they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And now they receive this power to be able to preach and speak in a language that they never knew. They didn't understand these languages. Now, the reason why it's important to understand that is because you know, people will try to take this passage, especially these, the, you know, the Pentecostals, that want to tell you that when they roll around on the ground and just have a bunch of jibber-jabber come out of their mouth, that that's somehow associated with the Holy Ghost. But it's not, because every example that we have of somebody speaking with another tongue it's, it's very clearly being referred to as an actual language, as a real language, as a language that the people present were able to understand. Not some, they're like, oh, there's an angelic language. Because, look, what, in these Pentecostal churches, when they supposedly speak in tongues, nobody understands what they're saying. Because it's not a real language that they're doing. It's made up. There's a, I forget what the technical term is for it, but um, people, you can do this. You can get yourself into a state to just, where, where you could allow your body or your mouth to just start basically babbling. And it sounds similar to a language, but they're just conjuring this up themselves. And some people, I believe, are actually get demon possessed and, and then they're really out of control. And that's a whole other story. I really don't want to get too far into that and speaking in tongues because it's not the, the scope of this sermon. But what we're seeing here in Acts chapter 2 is saying, you can see in verse number 7, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So they're saying, wait a minute, all these people are from the same area. They're all from the same part of town. They all grew up here. They all grew up in Galilee. All these men here that are talking, they're all Galileans. So then they, this is why they're shocked or they're surprised in verse number 8. It says, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So a tongue is not a mysterious thing. It's just a language. They're saying, how do we hear what they're saying and understand what they're saying in our native language? The place where we were born. Because it, it says here, it, it continues on there in verse number nine, and it, and it tells how there are people from all over the world congregated together at the day of Pentecost. Devout Jews, people from all over the world that, you know, converted to Judaism, they converted to this religion. They were coming back to worship at the day of Pentecost, but they grew up in another country. They have a different native language. They weren't native Hebrew speakers because they were dispersed. When, when Israel was taken captive by the Babylonians, you know, there's, there's this great 
a, a dispersion into all the earth. In the all the earth, now there's still a segment of them that that were able to stay together in Judea, but there were so many people that still had scattered around and were growing up. They were born in other nations. They were, they were brought up and they had a different native language. So when they come here and they hear these guys are like, these are Jews. What are the, you know, these, these are Galileans specific to that region, not just Jews, but Galileans. How can we hear what they're saying in our own tongue, in our own language? And it lists off starting in verse number nine, 10, 11, you know, all these various places of the world. And, you know, some of these places you might not recognize, but some of them you do. How about the Arabians? Don't Arabs have their own language? Yeah. It's called Arabic, right? I mean, it, and, and it's, not, it's not that hard to tell. There's many people listed here. They all had their own language. Now, in our world today, there seems to be less and less people. You know, th there's more people kind of getting into almost a universal language of English. English-speaking people are, are found all over the world. But it hasn't always been like that for the most part. And you look at, especially like in the European countries and stuff, there's some real small nations that have their own language. And then, uh, you know, and other people right next to them, you know, I, I'm, my, my heritage or my, my the, 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 the highest percentage of, of um, what my heritage is is Latvian. A lot of people don't even know where that is. It's by the Baltic Sea. It's, it's, it's one of the Baltic states. You got Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia over there. And Latvia has its own language. It's Latvian. And many people probably have never even heard of that before. But there's so many languages out there. And this is the point that there's all these people, they all speak different languages, some just, just completely different than others, but they can all understand what the disciples are saying. What are they, you know, everything that they're preaching about. It says here, the wonderful works of God. They could hear them in their own tongue. They don't have to, they're not hearing them in Greek. They're not hearing them in Hebrew. They're hearing them in whatever place they, they, they grew up in, in that native tongue. That's the miracle. That's what's amazing. And this happened as a result of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because they, could, they couldn't do that on their own. They needed the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, immersing them to be able to perform such miracles. And this is the promise that was given. Uh, we see one more example of the Holy Ghost, of, of being baptized with the Holy Ghost. The reason why I'm spending a little bit of time in this and talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Ghost like this, is because there's some people that will teach wrongfully that after you get saved, you're baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that's their answer, to, because you know, some people don't know how to answer, which we're going to get to that in just a minute. It's the next point of you know, any verse that might say anything even close to um, you know, those that are, that are saved being baptized. So they say, oh, oh yeah, well, that, that verse is true, but it's just talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Wrong. There's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, where the, the Holy Ghost resides inside of you, which we have as believers. Every person today that puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit of God come and reside inside. But coming inside is not the same as a full immersion in a baptism because every time we see an event of some immersion of the Holy Ghost, it's followed up by these miracles and in doing these, these, these um, supernatural works of God, whether it be healings or speaking in another language, or, you know, anything that we see the disciples doing, that's when they're baptized with the Holy Ghost. And in Acts chapter 11, you can stay in Acts 2 if you want, but in Acts chapter 11, there's another example of this happening. Verse number 15 says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace. So this is Peter recounting the story when he went to the, um, to the, the, uh, the Italians. There was, um, what was his name? It was in Acts chapter 10, I think. And... Uh, he goes unto this guy and he goes to preach the gospel. 
And when he's preaching unto them, the Holy Ghost falls on them, and they start speaking with other tongues. They get this gift of the Holy Ghost, and he remembers and says, oh, yeah, I remember this. John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. When they started speaking with other languages, he, he knew right off the bat, wow, they've been baptized with the Holy Ghost as we were. And the reason why that was important is because they were Italians. They were Gentiles. They were not Jews. They were not of Jewish stock. So that was kind of a big thing for him to learn and to understand that, hey, God's given this gift un, unto other people too. It's not just the Jews anymore. It's, uh, it's, for, it's for others as well. So that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Not everybody gets that. Not everybody is going to be baptized or immersed in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit of God to do these great works and these miracles. But all believers today have the indwelling. And that's the difference I want to make. And I preach an entire sermon on that as well, the difference between the indwelling and the Holy Ghost coming upon you. But um, you're in Acts chapter 2 there. Jump down to verse number 37. Verse number 37 in Acts 2 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Because this is Peter is preaching up to this point, and he's basically saying, Hey, you know, the one that you guys crucified and afflicted and nailed to the cross, that he's the Christ. And, you know, he didn't do anything wrong, and, and you guys did this wickedness. So they're pricked in their heart. It makes them feel bad. They're like, Oh man, these people are listening. They see these miracles and they're just like, what did we do? Now they're regretting having any involvement in shouting, crucify him, crucify him to Jesus Christ. They're pricked in their heart. So then they say unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do about this? And here's Peter's answer. And then in verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, this is, uh, there's, there's, a whole, <laughs> there's a whole denomination of people that basically would call themselves, we're Acts 238. That's what we believe. I've seen it as like the name of a church, like Acts 238, because they always point to this as their, their solid verse. Like, this is what you need to be saved. You need to repent of your sins. You need to be baptized. And if you don't do those things, you're not saved. And of course, we know that just the word repent standing by itself does not mean repent of your sins. The word repent literally means to rethink. It's a change of your mind. And, um, being baptized is also not a part of salvation, but they take one verse like this and they run with it. Now, when they ask a question, what shall we do? It's like saying, you know, hey, what should I do? Well, are there not a lot of things that you should do? If an unbeliever said, well, what should I do? Well, you should get saved. You should get baptized. You should go to church. You should stop sinning. You should live a good life. You should, you know, there's a lot of things we should do. That's not all talking about salvation. Yeah, salvation's in there. You should get saved. But there's a lot of other things you should do too. But notice the difference between Acts 2.38 where, where they just say, well, hey, men and brethren, what should we do? What should we do about all this? Versus in Acts 16 where the man says, what must I do to be saved? Which verse is a little bit more clearly defined as far as what's being asked about salvation? Acts 2.37 or Acts 16, verse 30? What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That is a very clear scripture. And that is directly talking about salvation and what you have to do. And guess what's not mentioned in the answer? Baptism. Not mentioned. Why? Because it's not required for your salvation. But people want to take verses like this and say, see, it says you need to repent and be baptized. Everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the biggest problem that they have with this, other than just ignoring all the other clear scriptures that never mention baptism for salvation. How could they possibly be true if baptism's necessary and someone says, hey, what do I have to do to be saved and you don't mention baptism? That's a lie. 
Or Jesus Christ himself said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He doesn't say that whosoever believeth in him and is baptized should not perish but have everlasting life. If it's a requirement, then Jesus Christ is a liar. And that's what they make Jesus out to be, is a liar when they try to add their works to salvation. Because yes, getting baptized is a work. It's a work. It may not be a difficult work, but it's a work. But in this verse, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, one of their major fails is understanding what the word for means. F-O-R, the word for. When we think of, of the word for today, kind of the way that we use it a little bit more frequently, but still not exclusively, is, um, you know, if someone says, what did you do that for? Like, why did you do that? Right? It's kind of a why, a why question or answer. That's the way they're applying the word for here. They're saying, well, you need to be baptized for the remission of sins, basically for you to have your sins remitted, for you to have your sins paid for, you need to be baptized. But that's not what the word means in this context. And I don't know if it ever does in the Bible. Actually, I'm not, I'm not positive about that. But the context is what determines it because there's another meaning for the word for. And the easiest way to remember this is think about the signs like the Old West. And let's say you had a picture of Billy the Kid. What would it say up there? Wanted for murder, right? Wanted for burglary. Does that mean that somebody is advertising, say, hey, I want Billy the Kid to do a murder for me? Is that what that means? No. It means they're wanted because of murder, because of what they've done. So that word for means because of. So we get baptized for the remission of sins because of the remission of sins. Baptism is something that happens after you get saved. We get saved and our sins are remitted. The moment you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, all of your sins are forgiven. They're paid for. You receive forgiveness. You receive eternal life. Now, now that you have that, after you're saved, you say, hey, I should get baptized because of the remission of my sins. Because I got saved, now I should get baptized. That's what that means. It's very simple. Repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Because of the remission of sins, get baptized. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 19. I'll just show this a little bit further. In Luke chapter 3, verse number 3, the Bible says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So again, that same phrase, for the remission of sins. He was preaching the baptism of repentance. Now, it didn't say he was baptizing with water in order to have your sins washed away. It says he was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's in Luke 3. This is talking about John the Baptist. This is what he was doing. He was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Well, in Acts chapter 19, we're given what he was preaching. What is the baptism of repentance? Look, we're going to start reading verse number 1 of Acts 19. The Bible says, And it came to pass that, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So he runs into these people, and they're like, We don't know what you're talking about with the Holy Ghost. We have no idea. These are people that, they got baptized, but they were never saved. They didn't understand why. They got, and, and you know what? This happens today. People get baptized all the time. People get baptized even in good soul winning churches that never fully comprehended salvation. And, you know, they said something right. Maybe they, you know, but, but it wasn't right in their heart. They didn't fully understand it. And they end up getting baptized. So here's some people. They got baptized under John's baptism, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand. So... Paul explains to them what John was preaching. 
Because they're like, well, we were baptized under John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, which is what the Bible said in Luke chapter 3. He was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So when Paul was preaching the baptism of repentance, that, that, that phrase that's being used there to describe what he's preaching is, is defined as that people need to believe on Jesus Christ. He was preaching salvation. The way that we understand salvation, believing on Jesus Christ. There's nothing confusing about this. Paul very clearly says this. It says that when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So once they found, oh, it's about Jesus. Oh, okay, yeah. He paid for my sins. That's what gets me. Okay, now they understand. Now they get saved, and now they're able to get baptized. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Notice, they didn't receive the Holy Ghost immediately after baptism. Paul laid his hands on them and gave them the baptism then of the Holy Ghost after they were baptized with water. And then they were able to uh, speak with other tongues and prophesy. So that's an explanation of Acts 2.38. But just think about this now logically. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. You know what? Go ahead and stay in the book of Acts. You don't, have, don't worry about going around. I'll, I'll just read these for you. Go back to uh, Acts chapter 2. Just think about this logically. If baptism is required for your salvation and Jesus came, Jesus' primary mission was to seek and to save that which is lost. Is it not? Is that not what he claimed to be here for? Is it not? I, you know, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Did Jesus succeed or did he fail in his mission? Did Jesus seek and save that which was lost? Did he get anybody saved when he was on this earth? I would say, yeah. I would say he was getting people saved. But listen to this. If baptism was required for salvation, the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse number 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and then we get a parenthetical state, statement, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Jesus didn't baptize people. He didn't baptize anyone physically. He wasn't the one doing it. Other people did it. Jesus wasn't doing it. So did Jesus just fail? Did Jesus not know, hey, maybe I ought to take matters in my own hands and get these people saved and not rely on someone else to do it? No. Other, they, you know, people were getting baptized, but Jesus wasn't doing it. But what was Jesus doing? He was preaching the gospel. He was telling people how to get saved. And we also have the example of the Apostle Paul because you know, people always like to say, oh, well, that was still like the Old Testament time and baptism wasn't quite necessary yet because baptism became a requirement later on, which is really stupid because they use verses. Sometimes they'll use verses in the Gospels. Sometimes they'll use verses in the book of Acts to try to say baptism is required. But even if they want to say, no, 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 that happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then, then the baptism was required. Well, then why did the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 say, in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you. I thank God that none of you got saved. Right? That's what he said. If baptism is necessary, he's saying, I thank God that, that none of you got saved, that I didn't baptize any of you. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, because those are the only people I really like anyways. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. I thank God I baptized none of you but Christmas guys, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. And now he explains, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Did the Apostle Paul get people saved? You better believe he did. Why? Because he preached the gospel, because the gospel is what saves. Baptism doesn't save. And he wasn't even sent to baptize. He said, I, my job was to preach the gospel. He was an evangelist. And guess what? People got saved whether or not they got baptized. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I called on the Lord from my bedroom. 
I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I called on Jesus to save me. I was saved. I was saved that instant. I didn't get baptized for, I think it's probably about seven years later. Seven years went by. But guess what? I did have the Holy Ghost indwell, indwelling me. I had the Holy Spirit. I had, I had, I had something, you know, I, I, was, I was definitely um, convicted from time to time on, on various things I was doing, but I never got baptized. If I would have died before, before I got baptized, you know where I would have gone? To heaven. Because baptism doesn't save. And you know what else? I wasn't baptized with the Holy Ghost. I wasn't speaking with other tongues that I didn't know. I didn't have the gift of, of healing and you could just see someone there sick or dying and just be able to put my hands on them and heal them. I wasn't baptized with the Holy Ghost, but I'm indwelled with the Holy Ghost. And I was given a free gift of salvation by putting my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. So now I want to get back to the challenge here in Acts chapter 2, hopefully. Verse number 41. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want to try to get our church following the model of the churches in the book of Acts. That's why we're doing the soul winning challenge. That's why we do the Bible reading challenge. That's why we're going to do this baptism challenge because we want to do a lot. They did a lot for Christ. They did a lot for the cause. They worked hard. They worked hard to preach the gospel. They labored day and night. They worked hard to get people saved. They worked hard to get people baptized. Here you had a, you had a, you had a day where there was at least 3,000 people that got saved and baptized. What an amazing event. Now this doesn't happen through the work of one person. There's 120 disciples at this time in the book of Acts that were meeting together. You had the 12 apostles, and then you also had um, you know, just other people, other disciples that were followers of Jesus Christ, about 120 people. But look at the work that they were able to do. Obviously, having the power of the Holy Ghost upon them was, was, was critical. But 3,000 people, man, praise the Lord. That's a multitude of people getting saved and baptized. Then we have this story in Acts chapter 8 of the Ethiopian eunuch. And in Acts chapter 8, of course, we get the, probably the most clear scripture just detailing that you, ha you get baptized after you get saved. Not when you're an infant, not when you're a baby, not when you just turn a certain age. None of that matters. What matters is you actually putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why you should never baptize an infant or a baby because they can't believe. They don't understand. They don't know any better. They don't know what they believe. And we see this story in Acts 8.29, and this is, this is an awesome story. We see, we see so many people getting fired up and getting saved and getting baptized. We see this story in Acts chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse number 29. The Bible says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So there's a man reading the Bible. He's reading the scripture and he's saying, Hey, do you understand what you're reading? He's like, I don't know. Why don't you come up here and show me? What a great opportunity. Man, wouldn't you love for this to fall on your lap? <laughs> to have someone just, just flat out ask you, Hey, explain the scripture to me. Explain salvation to me. And then verse 32, the place where he's literally reading, I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. It says, the place of the scripture where he, where, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? He's literally reading prophecy about Jesus Christ when he walks up to him. He could have been reading so many other passages in the Old Testament, yet he's reading this passage. And verse 34 says, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speakest, speaketh the prophet, this of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Which means, why can't I be baptized? They're under, Philip's explaining Jesus to him. He's explaining the scriptures to him. And he goes, the traveler goes, and says, Hey, there's some water right there. Why can't I be baptized? 
And Philip answers in verse 37, which is removed, by the way, from all the modern translations, from the NIV, or at least from most of them. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the reason why you can't be baptized. Is you can't be baptized unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you believe on him with all your heart. And he says, basically, I do. I do. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. He didn't go to Bible class. He didn't say, well, come to church week after week after week. We'll teach you about baptism. We'll, we'll, we'll look at you. We'll try to make sure that you're really saved. And then after a few months, we'll gather everyone together that, that passed the course, and then we'll baptize you. That's not what happened. That's not scriptural baptism. You know, people do this stuff that they're not right with God. This guy got saved traveling in a chariot. They came across water. He says, hey, let's get baptized. And he did it on the spot. The people in Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they were preaching the gospel. People were hearing the word of God. They're getting saved and they're getting baptized immediately. When you get saved, the best thing to do is to get baptized right away. Don't put it off. There's no reason to wait. I waited for seven years. There was no reason for that. I shouldn't have waited. But we see these events in, 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 in the book of Acts, and I think to myself, hey, would to God people would just want to get baptized. Wouldn't that be great? It seems like it happened a lot more than there was a lot more reason where people were, were identifying with the baptism. And this guy's like, hey, I want to be baptized. Now, we don't know, did Philip really bring up baptism at all? Or did he already know what was going on and hear about people getting baptized? I don't know. I don't know what his motivation was or how he even knew about the baptisms, but he decided, I want to be baptized. And he wanted to be baptized because he believed. So now I'm going to get in a few points of why baptisms are so hard these days. Because it seems to be a lot more difficult to get people to get baptized. They don't seem to be as willing to just, on their own, say, hey, wow, awesome, I believe. They've called on the name of the Lord and, and then go to the next step of just saying, hey, I want to be baptized. When can I be baptized? That doesn't happen very often at all. So why not? I've got a few reasons here why I think many people don't even consider baptism or don't want to get baptized right away. Uh, these, this definitely isn't comprehensive. These are some of the things that came to my mind. But these are things that are important to understand so that we could, um, we could try to overcome these objections or these problems that someone might have and really try to convince people, no, it really is important, you need to get baptized. So the first, the first point I have here, why baptism may be, may be difficult, is that it's a public profession. Usually the baptisms are done in a, in a fashion where you're gonna, there's going to be other people around to do this. Now, baptism is very public. It is something where you're saying, hey, I believe in Jesus Christ, and you're doing that in front of people. And, and it's a good thing to do. You're saying, I'm not ashamed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to do this. And um, typically, you're not usually around even a body of water. I mean, maybe you, you may or may not be. But, um, and, not, and I'm not even going to get into all that, but I don't think that everybody necessarily is... is you know, ordained to be baptizing people. But um, that's kind of a whole another aspect of baptism that I'm not going to get into this morning. But, uh, it, but it's a public profession. So I think many people are either too lazy to even go to church, which we see that happen all the time, or maybe they go to some other church or whatever, but um, people get saved. But it's one thing to get saved. It's easy to get saved. It's a whole other thing to actually get up and do that. And I was already talking about that earlier in the sermon. Or... Maybe they don't really care, right? They're glad that they're saved, but they're not all that interested in, in learning and growing and doing more. Now, is that possible for someone to be saved? Yes, it is. It's possible to be saved and a person not really want to do anything more. Why? Because salvation is easy. Because you receive a free gift. It doesn't mean you have to, that if you don't use it and you don't do all this other stuff, then you're never really saved. And I'm going to get into that tonight, by the way. I'm going to get in. I've got a whole sermon planned for that tonight. But um, we think about this story here 
of the ten lepers. And then, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 17. I want you to see this story. Because this, this shows that there are people out there that just might not be inclined to come to church and, and to get baptized or whatever. They, just, they might be lazy or whatever. Whatever the reason is, they just don't want to do it. And the first thing I just want to say is that that doesn't mean a person's not saved. Just because they don't get baptized doesn't mean they're not saved. Luke chapter 17, verse number 12, the Bible says, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And then it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. So Jesus heals ten people. They, were, they had the disease of leprosy. They call on Jesus, Right? They say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Right? They're basically asking to be healed. They go to Jesus. They call on Jesus. And what does he do? He heals them. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They called on Jesus. Obviously, this is a picture. This is a picture of their salvation because as sinners, we're, we have like this disease of leprosy just in our bodies, in our flesh, because we're sinners. Jesus offers the cleansing. He offers the healing from our sins, that the death and the corruption that goes along with our sin can be healed and washed away and we can become white as snow by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Girls, stop it and pay attention. So he cleanses 10 lepers, 10 people that were diseased. And it says here in verse 15, and one of them when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So in this group of people, there's one, you know, and the Samaritans and the Jews, the Bible says that you know, they didn't have dealings with one another. They kind of looked down, the Jews looked down on the Samaritans. So the Samaritan comes back. He's like, wow, I'm, at, I'm cleansed. And he's amazed. And he comes back to Jesus to basically just thank him for healing him. It says when he's healed, he turned back and with a loud voice glorified, praise God. And he fell down on his face, humbled himself before Jesus and gave him thanks. Verse 17, and Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? Didn't I heal ten of you? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God save this stranger which that would imply to me that there were some Jews in that bunch of lepers that he healed. And he's saying, I healed ten of you. Well, where's the other nine? And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus healed ten people and only one came back. Does that mean that the other nine were never really healed? No. It just means they didn't do what they should have done. What, they all should have returned. They all should have come back. They all should have glorified God. They all should have thanked Jesus. They all should have fell on their face and been like, thank you so much for healing me. But they didn't. Everybody that gets saved should go and get baptized and get baptized right away and say, Lord, thank you. I want to make this public. I want everyone to know. I want to get baptized. I want to start doing what's right. I want to live a great life. I want to come to church. I want to serve you. Thank you for saving my soul. But does everybody do that? No. In fact, it's a small percentage of people that return to Jesus to then say, I want to serve you. I want to do what's right. It doesn't make those that don't come unsaved. It just means that they didn't give thanks, that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Like he said, what should we do? Men and brethren, what should we do? What shall we do? We should do a lot of things. So that's, that's one thing. You know, baptism can be hard just because People just don't, wanna, don't want to do it. Now that first point, there, there's not a lot you can do with that. I mean, people just don't want to do it and they're going to have a bad attitude. I mean, you could, you could try to get through with them a little bit, but um, there's not a whole lot you can do. But that's not the only reason why people don't get baptized. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 6. Romans 
chapter number 6. Right after the book of Acts is the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6. Now, Romans, Romans chapter 6. I spent a lot more time on other things this morning and kind of getting lengthy in the, in the sermon time here. But read all of Romans 6 on your own time if it's what comes to baptism because it's, it's, it, it provides a lot of symbolism here. Basically, baptism symbolizes a newness of life and a dying to the old man. When a person is baptized, you know, the Bible basically explains to us that you know, we're, we're representing Jesus Christ in the baptism. So when you go into the water and you're standing there, it's like a representation of Jesus being nailed to the cross. When you get dunked under the water, it symbolizes the death and the burial of Jesus Christ going down un, into the ground. Right? So you're getting dunked under the water as Jesus was buried, and then you coming back up out of the water is like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the symbolism involved in that. Now, it goes a little bit further to explain here. We're going to see some of it in Romans chapter 6 that what we want to do is use our new birth, that new life of our salvation to say, I'm going to die to the old man. My old ways, my sin, the sinful nature that I have, I want that to die. I want all that that's nailed to the cross and I'm going to leave that behind. So when I get baptized and I get dunked under water and I come up, I'm going to now walk in newness of life. I want to do what's right. That is a big, uh, powerful symbolism of baptism. And I'll tell you what, I can't fully explain it other than just I know it's true and, and based on what we see in the Bible and I know just personally in my own life that even though I waited seven years to get baptized, but when I finally got baptized, that was a big turning point in my life. That was actually the moment when I decided, when I really started serving the Lord. Up until that point in my life, I was just kind of tossed about to and fro just in this world and just living in the flesh. I was saved, but I wasn't really doing anything for the Lord. It wasn't until after that baptism that just really cemented, hey, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to die to self, and I'm going I'm to live the way he wants me to live. And that is something that I think ought to be explained to some people because there's a lot of people out there that get saved that are looking for that. Yes, they're looking for salvation. They want to get saved. They get saved. And you say, hey, great. You're born again. Now let's work on just doing things right and cleaning up your life and getting on the right path. Come get baptized to help you out with that, to get your foot going in the right direction. Uh, Romans chapter 6, let's look at verse number 1. We'll just kind of read through this. I'm not going to expound too much on it. Verse number 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Right? Because after the Bible says it right before that, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No matter how much you sin, God covers your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's all covered. But should we just keep sinning? No, of course not. God forbid that we should keep sinning. Verse number two, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And it goes on and on. I was going to read more of that and expound more upon it, but go ahead and read that in your own time. Romans chapter 6, awesome verse explaining that. And this is something that is kind of a pivotal moment in the life of a Christian, saying, hey, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to take this step of obedience and getting baptized to, to use it to then walk in newness of life. And that is one thing that ought to be explained to people because, like I said, a lot of people want to do that. They want to clean up their life and explain, hey, get baptized. It'll help you. It'll help you to do that. 
And I think other people then will avoid baptism because maybe they don't want to walk in newness of life. They want the free gift, but they don't want to walk in newness of life. Number three, one of the reasons why I think people don't uh, get baptized today, I think this is actually relative, pretty prevalent. Some people in that feel there has been a big change in what they believe. Living in the United States of America, so many people have heard about Jesus Christ. They've heard about the gospel. They've heard so many things. And there's so many, quote-unquote, Christians out there but that are not saved because they believe wrong about salvation. Maybe they believe you could lose your salvation or they, or they, don't, they never fully understood the free gift. They didn't, you know, they, they've heard the death, burial, resurrection. They've heard a lot of facts. They heard a lot of various things. So then when you clarify for them and explain, no, really, look, it's not based on your works at all. And, and they, they probably heard it's not based on your works. They believe, oh, yeah, it's not based on your works. But in their heart, they actually believe that if they, if they mess up and they screw up and they sin, well, they're not going to be saved anymore. That is a works-based salvation, even though they've already been programmed to say, oh, no, it's not works. So when you explain it to them and they finally understand and they get it and they get saved, they still might not think that, well, there was really that big of a difference in what I believe. I already believe Christianity and all this other stuff. And, you know, they might realize, yeah, I wasn't saved before, but it's not, it's, it's not as big of a difference as, say, like, if someone converted from Islam and they got saved, they'd be probably a lot more likely to say, hey, I want to get baptized. It would mean a lot more because they're coming from such a, a big difference of backgrounds but when you have people that are basically i mean they're basically already christians but they're not saved it's it, it's it in their mind it's a minor difference even though it's not i mean you could say it's just as big of a jump they were unsaved just as much as the muslim is unsaved they're, they're they're both headed to the same place and they both ought to be rejoicing over hey now i'm saved now i ought to get baptized but I think that that might play into it as well. It's just it's not as big of a jump. So like, oh, okay, well, I was already baptized as a kid or whatever, you know, good enough. Now I'm saved and I was already baptized, fine. But it's not, and people need to understand that too. And that's a good place to show them like Acts chapter 8 where, where you know, maybe they were baptized previously, but they ought to get baptized again. And then number four, my fourth point on this is just that many people don't even know much about baptism. They don't know it's a command. So turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. This is my last point, and we're done with the sermon. Last point, Acts chapter 10. Verse number 40. The Bible says, Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So this is the gospel, again, being preached, right? He was dead, dead buried. God raised up the third day, showed him openly. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To, get, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. This is the story that I was referring to earlier. When Jesus gave the gospel to these people and they start speaking with other tongues, then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And I just want to point out here real quick, they received this, this baptism of the Holy Ghost even before they were baptized in water. And the Pentecostals will tell you, oh, no, you get the gift of the Holy Ghost after you get baptized in water. That's the way it happens. That's, you know, it's like, well, that's not the way it happened here. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost before they even got baptized with water. Because it was after they got saved, which is what, what ultimately matters as far as being able to receive a gift of the Holy Ghost. Then in verse 48, look at this. It says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He commanded them. He instructed them. He told them, you need to be baptized. And, and guess what they did? They got baptized. He commanded them. It's a command. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 28, which is known as the Great Commission, at the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all, even unto the end of the world. Amen. 
The Great Commission involves not just preaching the gospel, but baptizing them. Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize people. It's a commandment. It's something that we ought to do. It's not optional. Now, as with any commandment, not doing it doesn't make you unsaved. What gets you saved is, the, is belief in Jesus Christ. That's you know, just any commandment. You don't have to follow all the commandments to stay saved or to be saved. So you don't need to follow the commandment of being baptized to be saved. But it's a commandment. So if you remember anything, when you're, when you're trying to convince someone or show someone, and, you know, especially this month ahead, the goal is to try to get one person baptized. Maybe they were already saved before and they're not baptized yet. Or maybe they, you, you get somebody saved. Try to follow up and follow through and just explain the importance of don't leave that out. Sometimes you talk to people and they have plenty of time. You go through, you're already done with salvation. You get done leading them to Christ. Use that time then to bring up, hey, why don't you get baptized? It, we have soul winning times right now. Our soul winning times coincide with church. So it's great to say, why don't you come to church tonight? We get you baptized. You know, it's a command of God. Explain to them, show them Matthew 28. Say, Jesus commanded people to be baptized. Don't you want to now kind of follow Jesus, obey God, and, and start living right and do what's right? Well, we'll help you with that. And, and just so you know, I will baptize people whenever. And anyhow, if somebody is willing to get baptized, I'll do whatever it takes to get them baptized. We've got the, the stuff here. It doesn't take very long to fill up the tub to get someone ready to be baptized. If we know in advance, it's a little bit easier, it's a little bit better, but it doesn't matter. Someone could get saved out soul winning. And if you get them to say, yeah, and you got to strike when the iron's hot. I mean, get people when they're motivated. You know, usually right after they get saved is a great time to get them baptized because it's in their mind. Invite them to church, get them in here, and we'll get them baptized. And if it's another day of the week, and they want to get baptized that day, let me know. Give me a call. If I'm available, if I'm able to do it, we'll go, we'll go to a hotel swimming pool and just go in there real quick and just baptize them and get out of there. Whatever we have to do, we'll find some water and we'll get them baptized. Whether it's here or someone else, we'll do it. So let's, let's focus on that this month. Let's focus on, on not forgetting these things because it's easy when you lead someone to Christ to just kind of forget about certain things and not really bring it up and not pursue. We've got index cards that you could use to get information, write down their name and their phone number, and just ask them, say, hey, do you mind if I, if I follow up with you a little bit more? I mean, talk to them about baptism then, but then if they're just, you know, if, they're, if they seem interested, but they're not like gonna commit right then to do anything, get their information. Do you mind if I call you? Do you mind if I stop back by? Do you mind if I do that? And get their information from them. Now, if they say, yeah, I'd rather not, I mean, just, just judge the situation, then don't, you know, obviously don't, don't pursue after it. We're not trying to harass people. But if they seem interested and they're genuine and, they, you know, and they, they, they don't mind you following up with them, get their information, follow up. Let's see if we could get a, a bunch of baptisms in March. And continuing on after that, of course. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for salvation, for the free gift that we've received, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be good disciples of yours, to go out and, and continue to spread the good news, the good message, the gospel of our salvation, dear Lord, and help us also to try our best to just disciple people. Pray that you please work in the hearts of those people who we reach and, and stir them up to, to want to do more and help us to, to really help to nurture them and to, to get people in and, and, to, and to help to disciple them and to teach them to observe all things whatsoever you've commanded us to. Lord, help us to fulfill the entire great commission that was given unto the disciples. Lord, help us to do the same thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.